Hello and welcome. I'm Mary Statzer, curator of prints and photographs at UMM Art Museum. I'm so happy to see all of you here and to welcome you all um, watching on Zoom. So thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for coming to hear Erin Dugan, co-curator of our current exhibition, Art for the Future, Artists Call in Central American Solidarities. It has been a pleasure working with Erina and her co-curator, Abigail Satinsky, and the whole team at Tufts University Art Galleries, who is circulating the exhibition. We congratulate Erina and Tufts for our wonderful, deeply moving exhibition. We are so very happy to be hosting it here in New Mexico. Before I introduce Erina, I'd also like to acknowledge and introduce Sabra Moore. Sabra is, yeah, thank you for holding up your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Sabra is a wonderful artist and activist who is not only in the exhibition, but is part of the amazing community of artists here in New Mexico. Sabra left New York in the 1990s and rooted her life and work in northern New Mexico. Please make sure you see her pieces in the Johnson Gallery on the lower level of the museum. Um, it's the 13 foot uh, collaborative accordion book called Reconstruction Codex. Um, she organized this amazing project uh, with 20, was it 20 uh, women artists um, uh, from all over, the, all over the world, Latin America and the United States. Yeah. Um, she has um, also a wonderful related wall piece that's representative of several wall pieces that were part of the installation in the 80s. Uh, so please don't miss it. Um, Sabra's archives um, from which the Reconstruction Codex was lent to us are held at Barnard College. Uh, I'd encourage you, she just had an exhibition that came down at Barnard and please look at Barnard's website for more information about uh, Sabra's amazing archives as well as the exhibition that she had there. I also wanna point out uh, Sabra's memoir, which was recently published. Um, it's called Openings a memoir of the women's movement, New York City, 1970 to 1992. So um, Sabra's roots as an activist and an artist, both in New York and New Mexico are long and deep, and we're so happy to have her here today. Thank you. Also, while I have you here, I wanna make you aware that this is the first of several public programs designed to accompany Art for the Future. October 27th, there will be a panel discussion moderated by co-curator from Tufts University Art Gallery, Abigail Satinsky, with the founder, founders of Artist Call, the artist, scholar, and activist Doug Ashford, the filmmaker Danielle Flores Asensio, who's also a, still a very active um, uh, activist, and New, Me New Mexico's own critic, writer, and activist Lucy Lepard. October 29th, there will be a film screening, screening of AMA, a film by Danielle Flores de Asensio that looks head on at the genocide of 30,000 indigenous Salvadorans. There will be a discussion following the screening with Danielle and Patucci Gilbert from Acoma Pueblo and other captivating commentators. So please look for that. On November 16th, artist Muriel Hasbun will lead a workshop that is open to students, faculty, staff, and the general public about art as a catalyst for personal storytelling. Please watch our website and social media for more details about these events. Now I'd like to do um, Erina, who's sitting to my left. Um, Erina Degan is Professor of Art History at Texas State University. Her research and writing address three interrelated areas, artist activism and solidarity practices, documentary photography and its history and its histories and race and its representation. She is co author of global photography, a critical history author of the self in black and white race and subjectivity and post war American photography and co editor of beautiful suffering photography and the traffic in pain. She is also um, the are you considered editor. Of this amazing book or the yeah, co-editor yeah, co-editor with, with Abby <laughs> with Abigail Satinsky at Tufts University of the catalog for this exhibition it's a fa fantastic book with contributions by both Erina Abby um, uh, Kenzie Cornejo who is a UNM um, professor of art history here 
and um, our other Sabra. artists and Sabra and yeah, on and on. Um, it's available um, at our museum and also online. And I encourage you to, to get it. It's really terrific volume. Um, Erina has a new uh, book forthcoming titled Cold War Camera. She is also currently finishing a book manuscript on Artist Call entitled Visual Solidarities, supported by the Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant. In addition to all of that, I had the distinct pleasure of co-organizing an online global photography symposium this time last year, um, which was uh, we organized with um, Terry Weissman, Weissman and Heather Dyack, yeah. um, which was a great amount of fun. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so almost exactly this time yeah. last year. Yeah. Um, it was co-sponsored by um, this museum, UNM Art Museum, along with Craner Art Museum at the University of Illinois um, in Champaign. I jumped at the chance to work again with Erina and to bring this exhibition, Art for the Future, um, to UNM's audiences. Please help me to welcome Erina Dugan. Okay, wow. Thank you, Mary. That was such a warm welcome. I really appreciate it. Um, and congratulations again on the opening of Art for the Future. It is beautiful, it looks beautiful. Um, the exhibition had a lot of setbacks because of COVID as I'm sure you know we've all lived through. So it is really amazing to see it have these wings. So thank you again. Um, I wanna thank Mary, RF, Devin, the rest of the staff here at the University of New Mexico Art Museum. You all have done such amazing work bringing this exhibition here installing it, um, hosting us. It's, I'm really um, so grateful to you. I also want to thank my co-curator, Abby Satinsky, who you will um, get to meet when she comes back here, as well as Dina, Caitlin, Laura, and the rest of the team at the Tufts University Art Galleries, who have done um, incredible work, uh, you know, bringing this exhibition here. It is truly a labor of love on their part, and I'm very grateful to them. And then finally, I wanna thank all the artists and activists um, who are in the exhibition, especially Sabra Moore, who is here today. Um, this exhibition, Art for the Future, would be nothing without you. So my, um, my gratitude to you all. So today I'm gonna to talk about how this exhibition, uh, many years in the making, came into being. And, uh, some of the ways in which we conceptualize really its sprawling activities. Uh, those of you that were at the tour today know, you know, it ranged from art to poetry to performance um, to film and on and on and on. Um, I hope in turn that you will spend some time um, in the exhibition itself, um, in the museum. It's uh, on view on all three floors. It's amazing to see this work again and in this new venue. Um, the exhibition is on view through December 3rd. As Mary's are, Mary has already said, there's amazing programs that, that they have um, developed. And as she also mentioned, it's accompanied, of course, because this was a labor of love in and of itself. Let's see if I can get it to go, maybe not. I'll try this one. Um, no. My first technical difficulty already. <laughs> Help me. You just need to click into the screen. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Let's try, Let's try now. Perfect. Yes. All right. Perfect. Um, this labor of love, um, our catalog, which, as Mary said, you know, you can see there's several copies in um, the exhibition, but it's also available for purchase if you wanted. Uh, and um, it was published by Inventory Press who I think did a really great job designing it. Um, and it is bilingual, so both in Spanish and in English. All right, so I first came to know of Artist Call uh, through Susan Mizellis's photographs of Central America. I learned about these photographs when we, we included this image um, of the 1981 El Mozote massacre in El Salvador as it was used 20 years later um, in Beautiful Suffering, Photography in the Traffic and Pain, an exhibition that I co-curated in 2005, so long time ago, um, 
at the Williams College Museum of Art. When I began teaching history of photography at Texas State University the following year, I turned to my Zalas, especially her book Nicaragua that you see the cover of here as a way through as a way to think through kind of the complexities around photography's circulation and distribution. I was especially drawn to how my Zalas had not only photographed the Sandinista revolution, but had returned to these images over time to explore their reuse, especially within Nicaragua. Um, and here is my Zalas's 2004 project, Reframing History, in which she placed murals on public walls and in open spaces in towns and at sites where her photographs were originally made. Around 2012, um, so this you know, left a mark on me, but it took me a while to think about it. So around 2012, I, I began to think more deeply about this kind of reuse of my zealous photographs. And I was especially interested in how the meaning um, of a photograph like this Molotov man, as she came to call, call him, shifted in terms of its use on a poster, on a matchbox and on a wall. Through these contexts, I came to understand via the writings um, of photo theorist John Berger, how a photograph quote, acquires something um, of, of that which was and that which is. I began to think more about this idea that Berger terms a living history um, and so began to investigate other reuses of my zealous photographs from of Central America. And it's this research that led me to Timeline, a chronicle of US intervention in Central and Latin America, which was an exhibition, and you're seeing an installation shot here, organized in 1984, right, as part of Artist Call um, by the, it was organized by the Artist Collective Group Material. And you can see the era, which I've added, that was not, <laughs> just so you can see um, the placement there of two photographs by my zealous, both taken in El Salvador in the early 80s. So this exhibition timeline was on view at PS Con PS1 Contemporary in Queens, <coughs> New York. And it consisted of a disparate, I think you get a sense of that in the install shot, array of objects that were hung either above or below this three inch red painted timeline that extended across, you know, across all um, four walls of the room. And the timeline spanned the years from 1823 to 1984, with dates marked off in black, as you can see here, that cor correlated to a chronology that had been prepared in collaboration with members of the Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador, or CISPIS, which, many, which some of you may know, this organization, and it was the New York office of CISPIS. But when group material placed the exhibition's artifacts and artworks alongside right, this red painted timeline, the dates when the objects were made did not necessarily align with those marked off on the timeline. So for instance, Richard Prince's um, untitled Cowboy Saddling Horse from 1983 was mounted above the year 1823, the year um, the Monroe Doctrine was first introduced. And um, Bolivar Ariano's 1982 photograph of recently killed Salvadoran guerrillas was hung just to the right of 1932, the year of the Salvadoran peasant massacre, um, or La Mantanza, in which around 30,000 mostly indigenous people were brutally killed by the Salvadoran military. Learning about this exhibition and its approach to temporality was a turning point for me. In the spring and the summer of 2014, not long after I began research, this research on artists call, tens of thousands of Central Americans from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, a region then referred to as the Northern Triangle, were detained crossing the US-Mexico border, not far from where I live and teach in South Central Texas. At first, many in the news <clears throat> media sought to situate this influx 
of Central Americans, many of them unaccompanied children, as an immigration problem. My research on artists' call, however, indicated otherwise. These individuals were not just seeking better living conditions, but also requesting political asylum from ongoing violence, repression, and instability in their home countries, caused in part by the long-standing history of U.S. intervention in the region. This history, which includes the 1980s, when the Reagan administration used the pretext of, the Cold, of Cold War containment to legitimize U.S. military and economic support of authoritarian, authoritarian governments in Central America, had been a major contributor to the systemic causes behind this ongoing border crisis. I sought for my research on artist call to highlight some of these connections. This initial research led um, and formed uh, Northern Triangle, which is a traveling exhibition commissioned in 2014 by Blue Star Contemporary in San Antonio. I co-organized this exhibition with, um, my, with Jason Reed and Mark Menjavar, who are friends as well as colleagues of mine at Texas State. And they are members of, they're also members of the activist group Borderland Collective. Okay. And we, um, this exhibition was commissioned then by Blue Star in response, right, to this border crisis. It was commissioned in response to the influx of Central Americans, especially unaccompanied minors seeking asylum along the U.S.-Mexico border. Group materials efforts to disrupt the presumed causality between what is shown and what is seen in their exhibition timeline and thereby draw attention to the kind of contingency and potentiality of these objects provided a framework for this exhibition Northern Triangle. For example, Northern Triangle included reproductions of drawings made by Central American children in response to the 2015 deportation raids organized under the administration of Barack Obama. Though made in response to these raids, these drawings shared notable affinities with the past. To begin with, the San Antonio organization Raices, who collected them, was founded and incorporated in 1986 under the name Refugee Aid Project, at a time when Central Americans, much like today, flooded into Texas after fleeing civil wars and social upheavals of, Central, of El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, as well as Nicaragua. The connections to the 1980s did not stop there. The drawings also shared visual affinities with children's drawings from the 1980s, one of which was on display in Northern Triangle that Mark had collected during a trip he made to El Salvador to document community rep repatriated from the UN-sponsored Mesa Grande refugee camp in Honduras. In calling attention to such correspondences, however, our exhibition did not mean to suggest that we are fated to endlessly replicate this traumatic history detailed in such images. Instead, we were more interested in exploring the contingency of the immediate past, or the ways in which returning to this and other past histories might generate a different outcome, both today and in the future. My discovery in 2015 of additional Salvadoran children's drawings also made at Mesa Grande in an exhibition at El Museo del Barrio as part of Artist Call is one such example. I discovered the flyer for this exhibition largely by chance. The previous year, I had interviewed Doug Ashford from Group Material and Daniel Flores y Ancienzo, pictured here in a newspaper article from 1982. That same year, Flores founded New York's Institute of Arts and Letters of El Salvador in Exile, or Inalce, whose call in 1983 for a benefit exhibition at the UN in support of peace in Central America set artists' call into motion. In our conversation, I asked about archival materials related to artists' call. While Doug had saved some materials, which are now on view as part of Art for the Future, Danielle's more precarious life had made it impossible for him to save anything, much of anything. In my search for additional materials, I visited Group Materials Archive at the Fales Library at NYU. And then on a whim, 
in the summer of 2015, I decided to visit the Archive of Political Art Documentation Distribution, or PAD, another vastly overlooked 1980s artist collective started by Lucy Lepard and others. That, is, that was housed um, at MoMA Queens in Long Island City, New York. MoMA's online Dada base, as they call it, um, <laughs> showed, I know, <laughs> just like, everyone's like, All right, did you misspell that? I'm like, no, that's what they call it. Um, <laughs> showed some documents related to artist call um, in Pat's archive. And so as I, I traveled there, you know, from Texas, and as I was looking at through some of these materials, the archivist there mentioned 12 uncatalogued boxes relating to artists call in the vault. And he asked, did I want to see them? Well, at first, I didn't understand what he was saying. Because I had looked in that catalog, right, I looked online, and there was no mention of any boxes related to artists call. But sure enough, when I went back into the vault, um, there were the 12 boxes, which to my knowledge remain um, uncatalogued to this day because of course chronic understaffing um, in the library. When I found these boxes, everything changed. Here were not only press packets and flyers, but all the slide submissions to the open call, letters, and copious notes related to planning and to fundraising. Some of these materials were authored by Lucy Lepard. others by Kosha Van Borgen. Their handwriting, as Doug Ashford, who later visited the archive with me and who pointed this out, of course, was quite distinct. Still, no one quite knows how these materials landed in MoMA Queens, likely through Lucy, maybe when she donated her materials to PAD, but no one is certain. While the exact provenance may never be known, I knew that I needed to do something with these materials. At first, I thought a scholarly book, because as an academic, that's what I do. Um, but in 2017, when group materials, Tim Rollins, who contributed this painting with, K with Kids of Survival, KOS, to Artist Call, in which sadly, because of conservation issues, couldn't travel, um, with this version of the exhibition. Um, when he died unexpectedly at the age of 62, I knew I needed to do something more public facing alongside a scholarly book. Serendipis serendipitously, um, it was at the same moment that Abby Satinsky reached out to me about contributing some material um, on artist call to a project she was working on at Tufts related to artist organizing. I've known Abby since 2015. Her partner, Anthony Romero, is one of my former Texas State students. When Northern Triangle was on view at Blue Star, she, um, Abby and Anthony saw the exhibition. And Abby, who is an arts organizer, curator, and writer on socially engaged art, was working at the time at Three Walls in Chicago. When she learned of our interest in traveling Northern Triangle, she applied for funding to bring it to Chicago. So when Abby reached out about Artist Call, I immediately told her about the boxes at MoMA and asked if she would collab wanted to collaborate on something bigger. Having written her MA thesis on group material, she was excited to collaborate. When she approached Dina Deitch, at, her director at Tufts, she was very enthusiastic as well, and I'm so thankful for that. And so the project was set in motion. As we began to talk through conceptual frameworks for the exhibition, temporality remained crucial. But again, our interest was not in linear or teleological notions of time, but rather we were more interested in expansive notions of time or conceptualizations that would take into account both time's promises as well as its failures and contingencies. Group materials timeline, of course, was critical to our thinking. 
but there were other models as well. Research and writing, and writing that I was doing at the time related to Luchar, an exhibition for the people of Central America, which was group materials exhibition from 1982, that they organized in collaboration with the Community Center El Talle Latino Americano, as well as Casa Nicaragua and CISPIS was another inspiration. Comprised of contemporary art and cultural artifacts from across the Americas, Luchar brought these works into dialogue with one another in a, man, in a manner that served to break down both national borders and aesthetic hierarchies. At a moment in the early 80s, when mainstream institutional commitment to Latin American art was still developing in New York, the efforts of group material to recognize and support the autonomy of culture and art making practices in Central America is considerable. At the opening, critic and activist Lucy Lepard recognized this potential when she refers to Luchar, Luchar and especially its exiled Salvadoran artist as, quote, an art for the future, as well as a vision for the revolution when it comes. In making these speculative associations, however, Lucy had no idea, I don't think, um, how quickly the exhibition's visionary thinking would manifest and that by January 1984, she and many of those associated with Luchar, Doug Ashford, Julie Alt, Jose Lee Carballo, Eva Cockcroft, Daniel Flores, Leon Golub, Jerry Kearns, Thomas Lawson, Susan Mizellis, Catalina Parra, Herb Purr, Martha Rossler, Juan Sanchez, Nancy Spiro, and the list goes on, would help launch Artist Call. Our exhibition's title, Art for the Future, taken from Lucy's speech at Luchar, evokes this future thinking. Yet despite Artist Call's widespread commitment to Central American cultural self-determination through the shared goal of radical transformation, the campaign was also riddled with difficulties and contradictions. Foremost among these was the efforts of its members to bring Central American art to the United States. In the initial call, and this is a copy of the initial call, sent by Artist Call in the summer of 1983 to solicit participation from New York artists, the organizers explained that as part of their backing, contributors would exhibit jointly with the exiled and embattled artist of Central America. Through the inclusion of these artworks, the campaign's organizers sought to support Central American self-determination by countering the spatial erasure and displacement of these artists, caused in part by the interventionist policies of the U.S. government. Yet despite these well-intentioned efforts to bring art from Central America, the artworks that artists call requested from the Sandinistas in Nicaragua never arrived and very few of the solicited artists from El Salvador responded to the call for works. Over the years, the failure of artists call to meet its aim of bringing art from Central America to the, uh, to the US has been accentuated. Without the representation provided by these solicited artworks from Central America, it would seem the campaign rather than envision futures outside of longstanding imperialist and neo-colonial histories and geographies, was once again speaking on behalf of the interests and wishes of its neighbors to the south. To what, again, to what extent then, despite the, its collaborative energy and transformational goals, was the campaign solidarity a form of re, repatriative practices, repa sorry, re, reparative practices that sought to replicate rather than dismantle longstanding imperialist and neo-colonial power structures? This questioning is heightened by our knowledge that today, the Central American revolutionary movements that artists call so avidly defended failed miserably. Former revolutionary and FSLN President Daniel Ortega, for instance, now rules Nicaragua in the same repressive manner as the 45 year Somoza dictatorship that the Sandinistas fought so hard to topple. In El Salvador, 40 years later, 
justice against those US-backed officers accountable for the atrocities committed at El Mozote, a flashpoint for many art organizers of artists' call, is still being sought. Moreover, El Salvador's president continues to re derail their prosecution in a bid to protect his armed forces and solidify his power. This past March, he also instituted a state of exception under which authorities can arrest anyone they consider suspicious. In the United States, things aren't much better. Central American migrants continue to be denied political asylum from ongoing violence, repression, and instability in their home countries, caused in part by U the U.S. longstanding history of intervention in the region. The utopian dreams of transformation that artists call imagined in solidarity with these struggles for liberation are equally elapsed. Artists call, at least in its New York City con configuration, was a short-lived campaign. The major events, including the main benefit exhibition at Judson Memorial Church, which opened in January 1984, in commemoration of the anniversary of the 1932 La Montanza. Within two months, however, artist call events in New York were already beginning to wind down. With the last official artist call meeting taking place in, in May 1984 in the loft of Leon Golub and Nancy Spiro. At this meeting, the future of artist call was debated. According to Doug Ashford, some in attendance proposed using the money they had raised to create a longer term organization for continuing the work of artist call. John Hendricks, however, who was present at the meeting, spoke out against this proposal. As a longtime activist and someone who had been part of Artist Call's campaign since its beginnings, including serving on its executive committee, Hendricks argued that Artist Call's formation had always been conceived as temporary and so should disband. This position held sway. In the end, as Doug recalls, quote, we, we, we voted to stay consistent with our goals stated initially. We sent the money to cultural workers in the region and began our work again in new areas of concern. Taking these many contradictions to heart, returning to Artist Call's activism in this exhibition has offered an opportunity to think about transnational solidarity differently. Rather than position this activism solely in terms of north to south networks or alliances of equivalency, our exhibition highlights the difficulties and incongruities as well as contingencies of forging cross border alliances. The exhibition was built foremost around the archives from MoMA. Unfortunately, because of MoMA's str stringent climate control expectations as well as their associated cost. These materials are not part of the traveling exhibition. They can, however, be seen in the exhibition catalog. And there you can also find an excellent proposal written by Josh McPhee about how MoMA might in fact make these archives more accessible. Well, it's disappointing not to have these materials here. The exhibition has benefited from the willingness of other artists and activists, especially Doug Ashford, whose archival materials and poster collection are featured in this exhibition. It's also benefited from Joseli Carballo, whose immaculately kept Latin American mail art portion of Artist Call is currently on view. And Lucy Lepard, who sent me boxes of slides, including never seen before installation shots that help, uh, helped us to piece together what images, what works were shown where. Donna Ann McAdams, who shared her spectacular photographs that are on view documenting artist calls procession for peace and the week of performances. And of course, Sabra Moore, who alongside Barnard made it possible to see reconstructed codex for the first time since the 1980s. All of these individuals opened up their personal archives and homes to us. Without these materials, it would have been impossible for Artist Call to bring, for Artist Call, for Art for the Future, sorry, to bring Artist Call's forgotten activist activities 
and entangle transnational networks of collaboration to light. At the same time, with over 1,100 artists participating in Artist Call initiatives in New York City alone, and no extant checklists that detail what works were included where and which were sold or returned to artists or makers, and covering objects from Artist Call to include in our exhibition was a largely fortuitous and, uh, and sometimes challenging exercise. In some cases, we discovered important works had been destroyed or lost. In several instances, we asked artists, Hans Hacke and Greg Cholette, to recreate the works that are currently on view. In other cases, we, we used works that the artist, Jimmy Durham, Alfredo Jar, Juan Sanchez, Serena, and Judy Bloom Reddy believe similar to those made for Artist Call. Clearly, however, there are many artists whose works from Artist Call we have not included, much less identified. It is our hope that Art for the Future inspires others to find and document these works so that a more robust history of transnational connections and hemispheric alliances during the 1980s can be written. Largely because of the network's connections and efforts of Lucy Lepard, art, artists call mushroomed into a nationwide activist campaign with events and activities taking place in Boston, Los Angeles, Houston, Chicago, San Francisco, Philadelphia, among many other cities across the United States and Canada. Our exhibition, however, focuses almost exclusively on organizing that took place in New York City. We focus our attention here for several reasons. First, New York is, the, is where Artist Call's organizing began and around which its archives at MoMA are centered. Second, given the enormity of organizing just in New York, adding additional cities would have made our exhibition unmanageable in size. Already at Tufts, it was shown across both venues that make up its galleries. Still, we hope the exhibition will encourage others to explore these additional sites of transnational exchange outside of New York, which were equally foundational and fundamental to the, art, to the activism of Artist Call. And in fact, if you look at the catalog, the essay by Yancy Perez begins to explore a little bit of that history in relationship to Los Angeles. Beyond Artist Call's present of 1984, the exhibition also takes up Artist Call's past or aspects of the historical context out of which its artist activism developed. These include artworks and archival materials related to artist protest against the Vietnam War, and in solidarity with Chile. Root Materials Exhibition Luchar, as well as other artist demonstrations against US intervention in Central and Latin America. In addition to Artist Call's past, the exhibition also explores its future. To reference this future thinking, we chose a selection of works made by a diverse group of contemporary artists, Fredman Barajona and Christian Lord, Benvenuto Chavajai, Sandra Monterroso, and Carlos Mota, among others, whose works address issues that resonate with the concerns of artist call. By situating these contemporary artists in terms of artist call, we discovered overlooked connections and hidden congruences, both visual and historical. For instance, Redmond Barajona, also known as Ala Ilia and Christian Lord's efforts to bring together the Sandinista National Liberation Front flag and the rainbow LBGD, LBGTQ flag, pride flag, in their collective project Banderas from 2014, share striking resonances with questions that Jerry Allen raises in her artist called performance Queer Revolution about, in the words of Jerry, quote, why this Nicaraguan revolution, so even full of women, turns tail and back on police interventions of gays, gathering in parks and quietly in the backs of restaurants, and why they don't demand of American, of American queer acceptance as much as they demand acceptance of their art. 
and you have to go listen to Jerry because I did not do her um, work justice there. Um, so go listen to her um, in the exhibition. Likewise, Sandra Monterosa's foregrounding of her Maya cultural heritage in her, ex, in her um, installation Expolaria from 2011 shares visual affinities with Sabre Moore's wonderful collective project Reconstructed Codex, in which 20 US-based women artists reconstructed one of the four surviving Maya codices as a symbolic act against cultural genocide in Guatemala. At the same time, placing these works in conversation with each other points to vital discontinuities that relates to questions around decolonization, self-representation, and agency. Within our exhibition, we have sought to use such connections and disconnections to show how solidarity does not simply mean shared commonalities and forged identifications. More complexly, it signals the broader histories, multiple temporalities, and vexed geographies in which the art and activism of artists call are irrevocably entangled both then and today. As much as the exhibition interrogates the inevitable challenges of solidarity, it does not abandon ideas of togetherness whole cloth. As group materials collaboration with CISPIS suggests, transnational alliances were fundamental to Artist Call's development, as well as its organizing around solidarity with Central America. This is because, returning to Lucy, Quote, if we can't work together, how can we exchange with and extend our audiences? How can we communicate our own personal and political passions and support those of our friends and comrades? The question of how to work with each other and the difficulties and incongruities that are often the product of working collaboratively has greatly informed our exhibition. Artist Call was an intergenerational, multiracial, and multi-ethnic, as well as transnational coalition of art and cultural workers that fostered cross-cultural and collective action. It showed collaboration to be a robust methodology. Given the polarizing climate of today's political landscape, in which Central Americans are demonized as dangerous criminals, placed on expedited removal, and children removed from their families, this kind of collaboratively produced transnational and contingent model of solidarity is needed more than ever. To that end, we invited five additional artists, Beatrice Cortez, Muriel Hasbun, Josh McPhee, Naim Mohaiman, and Antonio Serna to examine archival material from artist calls, nationwide activities, and make work for both the exhibition and the catalog in response to what they discovered in the archive. Seeing artists call through their particular interests and lived experiences has been hugely important in realizing the campaign's ambitions and limitations. I want to conclude by briefly talking about two of these projects, one by Muriel Hasbun and the other by Naeem Mohaiman. Muriel came to our exhibition with prior knowledge about artists call. In 2017, while researching at the Archives of American Art, she encountered two recordings, recordings of interviews labeled in the database as political art documentation distribution, discussion with unidentified Salvadoran artists, 1984. Both were conducted by Lucy during a trip that she made to El Salvador in 1984 as an extension of Artist Call. For Muriel, the descriptor unidentified Salvadoran artist was especially vexing since it denied agency to El Salvador's artists in the 1980s, especially those with whom she was intimately familiar through her, their involvement with the pioneering art space Galeria El Laberinto, which had been founded in San Salvador in 1977 by Muriel's mother, Janine Janowski, as a haven for artists, artists writers, and intellectuals largely over the course of El Salvador's 12-year civil war. <clears throat> While Muriel's first instinct was to correct this era in the archive, as she and I talked more extensively, we began to contemplate how in addition to returning agency to the Salvadoran artists from the 1980s, we might put these relatively, un these relatively understudied archives in dialogue with one another. We knew that El Laberinto and Artist Call were contemporaries 
and shared many similar goals. But as far as we could tell, their founders and participants were mutually unaware of each other. Still, we wondered, returning to the contingency of group materials timeline, might there be webs of association that we could uncover? Muriel and I first explored this potential in May 2019 when we participated in the collaborative artist scholar residency archive transformed at the University of Colorado Boulder. There we not only discovered overlooked connections and hidden congruences in these two archives, both visual as well as historical, but also fostered much needed conversation about under unre unrecognized and underrecognized visual alliances and solidarities between the US and El Salvador. Muriel went on to explore these issues further in her series Pulse, New Cultural Registers on View in Art for the Future. In Pulse, Muriel uses um, seismic registers that she uncovered in El Salvador's National Archive to counter what Guatemalan novelist and critic Arturo Arias calls, quote, the invisibility of Central American culture. This condition or lack of an identity politics for Central American Americans is, as Arias importantly theorizes, an artifact still lingering as one of the unresolved residues of the Cold War. To reckon with this history of non-belonging and non-being, Pulse seeks to, as Muriel explains, quote, heal the general misrepresentation and erasure of our own cultural expressions and identity, and thereby build a more connected, nuanced, dignified, and restorative future. In so doing, Muriel challenges the erasure of El Salvador's major avant-garde artists who were active during the tumultuous years of El Salvador's brutal civil war, including Carlos Gañas, whose exhibition opening at, Galeri, for, at Galeria Forma, Lucy in fact visited in 1984 when she traveled to El Salvador. Muriel's series gives voice to these so-called <coughs> unidentified artists from the 1980s and shows how their histories, memories, and cultural expressions are not only intertwined with the particularities of Muriel's own transnational and transcultural migratory story, but those of the over 2 million Salvadoran immigrants who now call the U.S. their home. Naeem Mohaiman also knew of Artist Call prior to our exhibition. In 2007, he included Doug Ashford's essay, Aesthetic Insurgency, Artist Call Against U.S. Intervention in Central America, 1982 to 1985, a touchstone for my early research, in the companion book for his co-curated exhibition, System Era, War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning at the Palazzo della Papisi in Siena, Italy. Doug and Naeem initially met in 2005 at Cooper Union, where Doug teaches, through their shared interest in intersections between political praxis and collective practices. Naeem was a member of Visible Collective when he first met Doug. It is their lifelong friendship alongside Naeem's longstanding interest in transnational alliances and collisions within the global left that led us to ask him to participate in Art for the Future. Just as Muriel uncovered overlooked artist histories from El Salvador, Naeem's research shed light an unseen South Asian community participation in artist call. While going through slides submitted to Artist Call's open call, Naeem found works by Zarina, Krishna Reddy, and Judy Bloom Reddy. For Naeem, this discovery was surprising. Though each had been an artist in Naeem's community, he had been unaware of their involvement in Artist Call. This realization led Naeem to make a film in conversation with Judy Bloom Reddy that centers on her home on Worcester Street, the Flexus Building known as the birthplace of Soho's artist community, and now a lonely remnant of that time. This film represents the webs of happenstance and connectivity that hold hope for beautiful accidents in artist communities. 
Naeem's conversation for in, with Judy, for instance, led to tracking down clips from Jonas Mikas's vast body of films to find the rare moments in which the Worcester Street building, as well as regular visitors Yoko Ono, John Lennon, Andy Warhol, and Mikas appear on screen. The visual connective tissue for the overall film is home movies, filmed by Judy's father, Bruno Bloom, between 1945 and 1970. The film also pays tribute to other fellow travelers of Judy, including Zarina, Anna Mendieta, Camille Billups, John Hendricks, all participants of Artist Call. In so doing, Naeem's film, Like Art for the Future, complicates expectations around collectivity in the arts and thereby shows how a consideration of transnational solidarity in all its intricacies and contingencies will lead to a more capacious understanding of the possibilities and predicaments of forging new ways of being together in the world. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Yes. Can I, it's okay if I move a little bit for the camera. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Can you tell us where this show has been already and where it will be going? Yes. Um, so this show began, um, it, it's a uh, product um, of both um, myself and the curator, Abby Satinsky, who I, I mentioned. Um, and she is a curator at the Tufts University Art Galleries um, in Medford and in Boston. Um, and so it began there. Uh, and then it's this is its first stop. It's slightly, you know, um, changed because, of course, you run into issues when you <laughs> travel things. It gets more complicated. Um, but it's largely actually, you know, pretty much what the exhibition was at Tufts. Um, it's here through December 3rd, and then um, it's committed to DePaul in Chicago, um, which will be really great because Artist Call, again, was, you know, um, had nationwide organizing in Chicago. Here, we're especially happy because of people like Sabra and Lucy, John Quick to see whose work is in the Codex, others that have, you know, New Mexico connections. Um, and then after that, it's uncertain. So those are the only, yeah, these two venues. Um, I'm really happy that it's it's going to two venues because at first it didn't seem like it was going anywhere. So <laughs> um, yeah, those are the two venues. And so if you know of people in Chicago, it will be coming there. I can't, rem I don't know the exact dates in March. Um, but it opens in March and it's up through August. Um, and in fact, it will take up the entirety of the DePaul Art Museum. Um, so again, another important university art museum. So it's been really great for it to be, um, you know, in university settings and to um, have students be able to engage with this material. Um, we really, you know, appreciate that and think that's, you know, a real benefit um, of these, these institutions. Will the work itself and the show stay together at all, or after it's done, after we're done? Um, no, <laughs> it will go back to very all the wonderful people that loaned it to us. Um, you know, some institutions, but many artists that have graciously loaned their materials to us. Yeah, it will get dispersed back um, and. Uh, the catalog lives on. The catalog lives on. Thank you, Mary. The catalog lives <laughs> in on. In your forthcoming book. Yeah, in my book. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yeah, on the future piece, are there any artists working today on some type of collaborative human rights or immigration advocacy work to elevate the urgent call for invisibility and uh, human rights of migrants? I think an excellent person that's here at UNM that I believe was on Zoom is Rebecca Schreiber. Um, who's been doing, I think, excellent work around that very topic, and I would look her up. Um, and uh, and she's a professor here in American Studies, and um, has been doing work, especially around collaboration um, with uh, immigrants um, seeking asylum. Okay. 
and then I could think of others, but I'll, I think she's the, she's the best example, but I can, you could email me and I could tell you others. Yeah. Anything else? Questions? Hey, yeah. yeah I'm curious, um, when you were researching this, talking with the artists, reflecting back, any, were you surprised by anything, like their recollections or their thoughts on the work? They did, and that's a broad topic, but you know, we're talking back on that time period if there was anything. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think. Um, well, it's, you know, it's always this interesting thing, you know, reflecting. I think, um, I remember, you know, so we conducted actually uh interviews with for the catalog, um, with a number of artists that were involved with Artist Call, and when we when we asked Lucy to write, she wrote a kind of introduction to our catalog. She wanted to read all the um, interviews that we had. And, you know, these were kind of unedited interviews. You know, we then edited them down for our catalog, but she was like, I don't remember that. And is that right? <laughs> right. And like, but she was like, well, I don't know. Who knows? I, I can't remember. Um, uh, and so it was great to kind of, you know, sense that from her of like, you know, what our memories, I mean, I can barely sometimes remember last week. Um, and we're asking our, you know, these artists to remember things, you know, and, and someone like Lucy, for instance, and we could probably, you know, bring Sabre into this conversation. Um, Lucy was involved in so many things, you know, um, and many of these artists, this is not, this was not like one activist thing that they did. This was, you know, one of many that happened before <laughs> and that would happen after. Um, and so, you know, I think they, you know, have certain rec recollections and it's about kind of pairing those memories with archival material and um, beginning to tell a story. Uh, and, um, and those stories vary. Uh, and um, I think rightfully so. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, what, and then having various voices, I think that's also the important thing. And what was important for us was to, to have um, many voices telling us, you know, about what was happening um, and not relying, you know, solely on one person. I don't know, what do you, how do you feel about that question, Sabra? I know, well, you kept these wonderful, Sabra kept wonderful diaries. Right. So what, what was interesting was that, you know, I, 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 I did write the book that, that, uh, that Mary mentioned, uh, Views by Women Artists. Um, well, Views by Women Artists was another show I did, but, but uh, Openings, uh, a memoir of the women's art movement, 1970 to 1992. And, but I had kept, I kept journals. And, you know, if you keep journals, you don't necessarily read them. Uh, and so, I, you know, I would refer back to them, particularly for like drawings or whatever, but I hadn't read them. And then when I started writing my book, uh, I decided to read the journals. And I've kept journals since 1964. I still write journals. And so I read the journals. And so what was interesting about reading them was that some things were really as I recall them, and some things were vastly different. Mm -hmm. And some things I totally forgot these people. Mm -hmm. And so it was an interesting uh, kind of study for me of like how memory mm -hmm. is not necessarily what you remember. Mm -hmm. And and because I had written them down, they were there. Mm -hmm. And actually, I used them a lot in the book. Then, then I would read journal. The journals were usually for six months. And then I would write. And so um, it was anyway so so it's an interesting experience and i had that recently you know just for because i write wrote, wrote the book and uh so people's people's memories are what whatever they are and and what you end up holding from an experience is not necessarily the thing you experienced at the time mm -hmm. so it's so it's always humbling but but it's also interesting because both of those things are real mm -hmm. you know and Absolutely. and so and both of the things are real. So, yes. and I think it's um, it's also one of the, you know, um, the pleasures of working on contemporary artists, but also a difficulty. Honestly, is that, you know, we have amazing people like Sabra, but she's all, you know, like she's here also. Like mm -hmm. I, you know, don't want to 
always speak for her. I want to speak with her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, you know, I have to say that, I mean, I, I remember that we had a conversation once when I first met you about Artist Call and because you had thought it was forgotten. And for those of us who participated in it, it, it was never forgotten. And actually, it, it informed our, the art that we've all ended up doing, you know, into the present. So, um, yeah, I mean, when, when one works in art, life goes on and, and you change, but you also bring with you from, from the past what you've done. Mm -hmm. And and I've done a lot of collaborations, and, and but the Codex was actually, you know, one of the sweetest ones I've done. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we should call it right there at 3.30. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for your attention.